Good morning, everyone. Let's center ourselves as we prepare for worship and listen to Lavella pray the play, pray the pl prelude. Thank you, as always, Lavella. It is well with your soul when you hear music like that, isn't it? It's just so peaceful and sets the tone for this morning. We are glad to see all of you this morning. I've been under the weather. Many of the bell choir and the chancel choir have been under the weather. Um, it's really great to be in the Lord's house this day, to feel the warmth and the sun outside, and to feel the warmth inside of fellow believers. May you feel refreshed when you leave here after we have worshiped our God this hour. Please take a minute to write your name and um, information on the, pew, the card in the pew pocket in front of you and pass it down. We do keep attendance as to who's here, and so we know also who's not. And especially in this, with the, all this illness, we do want to see who's um, able to be here. Do check the bulletin for upcoming, up, upcoming opportunities this week, 
including First Friday. And for those of you who have not come, it is a wonderful activity. Um, starts at 6 o'clock, homemade dinner. I don't know what's on tap for this week. Do you know, Roger? What is it? taco salad, and then um, many of our ladies and gents bring homemade desserts and um, pretty good deal for $2. So um, come, bring a friend, bring a lot of friends. Um, and we eat from 6 to 7 and play bingo from 7 to 8. And we have some prizes. Um, usually there's a blackout, maybe a $25 gift card, something like that. So pretty good investment for $2. Um, if you'll join me now in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Come, hear the call of God. Speak, speak of me to my people. I will give you words. I will always be with you as you speak my words of truth and justice and love. Praise be to God, who leads us in right paths. Now let us sing all the verses of our opening hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, number five, all verses, and please stand if you are able. join me as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please come be near us this morning as we open our hearts and minds to your message. Let the words that are spoken and the songs that are sung fall upon fertile ground so that we are empowered to do those things this week that we've been meaning to do in your hurting world. We know we need not look far to see pain and suffering. Instill in us a willing spirit to not put it off for another day. Our call, our smile, our card or note, they may be so important to our Christian brother or sister who receives it. Be with us now as we pray the, pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now to the life of the community. Um, Bev Brooks had a rod put in her other leg on the 25th. She is still at St. Joseph Hospital, right, Bill? And their son Royce is here from out of town. Nice to have you, Royce. Um, is she doing okay? Doing okay. So cards and prayers and thoughts would certainly be welcome. The quilt um, that is in the North X was requested by the prayer quilters for Carol O'Neill. Um, Carol's one of our lectern ladies and is on the official board, and she had knee replacement surgery. She is home from Lakeview, and so that's good. And so please stop and tie a knot. There is a congregational meeting immediately following this worship service. Your 2017 giving statements are available and they are on the name tag table. So do take one when you, yours when you leave. The Disciples Women's Cupid's Closet will be on February the 1st at 10 in the Fellowship Hall. There will be a potluck dinner to follow. And Howard and Leafa Maddox's 75th wedding anniversary celebration will be this coming Saturday. Um, from 2 to 4, where they reside at the Gables. They are former Westwood Christian Church people. They came as often as they could when um, the churches mer first merged, and um, now they live where Karen Lee lives. Um, so 2 to 4, the Gables. There is um, a flyer also on the ta um, table where your name tags are. Um, so please send cards, and feel free to go from 2 to 4 next Saturday. Um, it's kind of a lot of announcements here. Next Sunday is the soup, Country Bowl, Countryside Christian Church Super Bowl party. Um, Vicki and Rusty Cole are in charge, and it will begin. You can come at 4 o'clock next Sunday, bring a potluck to share. It will be in the um, North X um, or in the parlor. Deb Morshe has had quite a week. Please lift, let's lift up Deb. Um, her stepmother passed away this week. She just got word her 22-year-old cousin committed suicide in the last day or two, and her, her brother's mother-in-law is having some serious tests this week, so quite a lot for Deb and her family. And we would also ask for healing for Fred Hilton. He's having back, back surgery in February, and he is down with what everybody seems to have and on antibiotics and things, but he, he just needs to get better, otherwise his surgery will be postponed. Are there others that I need to lift, we need to lift up? Yes, Linda. Oh my, the 65th wedding anniversary for um, Gerald, Jerry and Virginia Jones. Congratulations on February the 2nd, correct? I, there, I didn't see anything on the bulletin board about Juanita. Roger? She is, she is improving, but very slowly. Very slowly. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Carl. Okay. All right. Now will you join me in singing Jesus Call Us or the Tumult, number 337, verses 1, 3, and 4.
Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we know that you do call us, even and especially in a world that is in such turmoil. It seems that every time we turn on the news or pick up a newspaper, we read of tragedies all over the world. A young toddler walks away and ends up in a pond, drowned. Suicide bombers everywhere. And we wonder, we wonder how long you will allow things like this to continue. And yet you promise us that you are with us always always, no matter what. Even in our darkest hours, when we lose loved ones for no good reason, you are there. When we celebrate a 75th birthday or 75 years or 65 years of marriage, you are there. The psalmist reminds us that no matter where we go, no matter what happens, you are faithful to us. Help us, your children, to be more faithful to you. We ask these things now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As Sheila mentioned, the uh, flu and various diseases kind of wiped out choir and bell choir, and we've all been kind of struggling with it. So we're going to rely on our congregational choir today. So we're going to ask you in a little bit to sing number 609, Take My Life and Let It Be. But let me tell you a little bit about this song because it has a very interesting history. Frances Havergill was an unusual woman. She lived in the latter part of the 19th century, 1836 to 1879. She's the daughter of a minister. She mastered Greek and Hebrew so that she could read the scriptures in their original language. Having grown up in England, she traveled to Europe and enjoyed skiing in the Swiss Alps, a very unusual recreation in the 19th century. She was also an accomplished singer who sometimes sang with the Philharmonic. Havergill was a Christian all of her life, but at age 36, she experienced what we might describe as a conversion experience. A little book entitled All for Jesus made her aware of the incompleteness of her own devotion, and she rededicated her life to Christ. Soon thereafter, she spent five days with a small group of people, some of whom were not Christians, and others who were, shall we say, lukewarm. She spent those five days witnessing to them and praying for them and was delighted to see her prayers answered. By the end of that week, all ten people had devoted themselves themselves to Christ. That night, too excited to sleep, Havergill sat up writing this very hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. Her devotion to Christ took many shapes. For one, she quit singing in secular venues and devoted herself to Christian music. For another, she donated her collection of jewelry to a missionary society to raise money for mission endeavors. But those were merely minor notes in the symphony of devotion that was Frances Havergal's life. Let us sing together, Take My Life. We're not going to sing all the verses, so I suggest you take a look at those. We'll sing verses 1, 5, and 6.
Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We'll be reading verses 15 through 20. Deuteronomy, that book of the Bible that is hard to spell. (laughs) Hear God's word, beginning with verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. And anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. So ends the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be holy and acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Next Sunday, the big game happens Sunday afternoon. And people all over the world, some huddled right back here in the fireside room, will be there to watch the commercials. <laughs> For this year's Super Bowl, a 30-second ad is a mere $5 million. That breaks down to $166,666.67 per second. And that's just airtime. That does not include the production cost of building and filming that ad to begin with. Advertisers will try their best to get us to purchase their goods, whatever those goods may be. Many of the ads will be creative and memorable, and more than a few will feature a celebrity or a familiar representative to help hawk their merchandise. Some of the celebrity pitch people get so connected to whatever it is that they're advertising that we just recognize them as being associated with that. Take, for example, how many of you remember William Shatner as Captain Kirk, or do you remember him as the pitch man for Priceline.com? Or most of you are old enough to remember Joe DiMaggio turning into Mr. Coffee. Brooke Shields became Calvin Klein, and Michael Jordan showed us all his Hanes underwear. They become so connected that years after those commercials have run, we still associate those products with those celebrities. Those celebrities add authenticity to a product, at least on the surface. For example, if the greatest basketball player of all times wears Hanes tagless underwear, if I wear that same kind of underwear, I can play basketball better. It doesn't work. (laughs) But what happens when those celebrities go off the rails by doing something dumb or something criminal? How many of you remember Jared Fogle? He was in nearly every commercial for Subway for 15 years. Why? Because he lost 245 pounds eating just their sandwiches. But in 2015, he was convicted of sexual misconduct with children and sentenced to more than 15 years in prison and Subway dropped him like a hot potato. Or how about Michael Phelps? He was pitching cereal for Kellogg. All of a sudden, a video surfaced of him smoking pot back in 2009, and then he got a second DUI in 2014, and Kellogg bounced him from the cereal aisles. He has since regained some of his endorsements, but Americans are more forgiving of superstars these days. Paula Dean, Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong, the list goes on and on of people who were at the top of their careers when their lives tumbled down 
and they were dropped from advertising certain products. Well, these are just a few of the sad stories of spokespersons gone wild, all of which lead to a bad image for the companies they endorsed. They were, after all, speaking on behalf of those companies they represented. But their behavior turned out to be a detriment instead of a positive influence. But such behavior is not limited to commercial endorsements. The church has plenty of its own high-profile pitch men who have been caught in scandals. Those who presume to speak for God or watched even more carefully and more closely than celebrities to see if their conduct and their character matches the message they are preaching. Discerning Christians like discerning consumers need to always be on the lookout for authenticity in those who would stand before them with what they claim to be the word of the Lord. Moses knew that this was going to be a problem for the nation of Israel, so he spends a little time in the latter part of Deuteronomy offering up some criteria for the kind of people God calls to be spokesmen and spokeswomen while warning them how to spot false prophets as well. The question for them is the same for those of us today who will either preach or those who will listen to we preachers. How do you know the difference between a real prophet and a religious pitch person? How can you tell if the message is on the up and up, so to speak, or if he or she is simply leading you into spiritual bankruptcy? In Deuteronomy 18, Moses offers two criteria for real prophets. First of all, the prophet will be like Moses. Second of all, the prophet will be raised up from among God's own people. In other words, a real prophet will speak and act in line with the law of God. And whatever they prophesy will affect them as much as it does the people because they have been called from among the people. They're important distinctions because they round out the prophet's words and work in the word of God and in the community in which and out of which they are called. Some of you probably know this, some of you may not, but I don't know of any ministers that just pop up out of nowhere. They always seem to be tied to a church somewhere, okay? Um, I am a Timothy, what is called a Timothy, from Hillside Christian Church. Bill McConnell tells everybody that's where I grew up, but I was 30 years old when I was a member there. But I grew up there spiritually, and I answered that call. At Hillside, there is a long hallway down by uh, their uh, parlor that has a picture of all of the ministers that have come from Hillside, men and women. The men are called Timothys. Barb, what are you called? A Priscilla. Barb is a Priscilla from this congregation. She grew up in this church, That's where, and she's back now. But when she was gone, she was a Priscilla from this church. That puts a tie to some place other than just here, just here. I actually share that hall with the former minister of Countryside, Roger Guy. Roger Guy is also a Timothy from Hillside, so don't hold that against me or I don't know. <laughs> But unlike the celebrity endorsers, a prophet should be well known by those in his or her community before they ever receive the call. People will have the opportunity to observe their personal persona in private, to witness their character in action, to determine whether their message matches the scriptures they have studied and discerned together in community. As God told Moses, the prophet will speak to them everything I command and whoever fails to heed that word will be held accountable in verses 18 and 19. The prophet will have a stake in the community to whom he or she preaches. Thus, whatever the prophet proclaims for the community will affect the prophet as well. To put it another way, the prophet's word is less directed toward you and move toward us. Moses' warning is especially poignant in an age when it's possible for one today to download messages from a host of celebrity preachers who are personally detached from our real-life communities by miles or wire or satellite signals. Many people in our day assume that 
If someone is writing books or has a huge online following, then he or she must be a prophet. The thing is, however, that a true prophet may not have that fat, fat book contract or a TV show. Their people know them, warts and all, and their message is often difficult to hear, which means that their audience tends to be smaller. Most of the time, real prophets are rather reluctant because they know that the message God has laid on them can sting them just as much as it does the rest of the community. Just look back at the history of the prophets of Israel and you will see that being a prophet is no picnic. A pitch man or a woman is primarily in business for the benefit of, re of received from hawking a particular product or agenda. Thus he or th she is more likely to use their platform to manipulate others to that end. When a person begins with an admonition like, God told me to tell you, or God gave me a vision, it should put you in high alert mode. History is full of those who have claimed a special hotline with God and have led people to destruction while lining their own pockets and feeding their self-indulgent impulses. Through Moses, God warns his people to watch out for those who speak in my name a word I have not commanded the prophet to speak because that word is usually their own in verse 20. A real prophet, on the other hand, is more likely to suffer for the word he or she is bringing. Just witness the trials of Jeremiah and Isaiah, John the Baptist, the disciples of Jesus for just a few examples. And God warns us about pitch men who are actually pitch men for other gods. In Moses' day, that meant the idols of the Canaanites. Oh, but there's still plenty of idols and false gods to go around today. If your prophet is making promises about your financial prosperity, that should be a major red flag. The biblical prophets were far more concerned about the poor than they were about the rich, as was Jesus. Guess what? So should we. Biblically speaking, if you are financially prosperous, your first priority should be to share that prosperity with those who are truly in need. Any prophet that puts his or her or your financial wealth ahead of generosity is simply pitching a product and not the gospel story. As Jesus put it so well, you cannot serve both God and money. You can't do it. Or as the Old Testament calls it, mammon in Matthew 6, 24. And again, the very same is true for you and me today. Their preaching lives out their call. The Bible warns us about those who come as wolves in sheep's clothing, as we read in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Most of you know, or some of you know, that Ed, Barb, and I are members of the Shawnee Mission Rotary Club. Each time we meet, every time we meet, we first open with prayer. Then we give the pledge to the American flag. And then we repeat what we call the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And four, is it beneficial to all concerned? Just because something is the truth doesn't mean you should always repeat it. It needs to meet all four of those. Those four things are not only important to Rotarians, they are also, or at least they should be, important to Christians as well. Now, as the Bible proves out, prophets are human and sometimes fail. So are preachers. Contrary to what some of you think, we don't walk on water, and we do make mistakes, just like each one of you. But as your minister, I always try my best, with God's help, to do what is right. And I use that little four-way test so many times, just over and over, I will sit and say, okay, it's the truth, but is it fair? Will it build goodwill, or will it tear people down? And is it going to be beneficial? So in closing this morning, let me end with this thought. All the things that I have said about prophets, 
not only apply to ministers, they apply to each one of you sitting in the pews here this morning as well. One of the ways in the Old Testament to determine if an Old Testament prophet was really speaking prophecy that was the word of God was if their prophecy actually came true. The same holds true for the church today. If the church is really living out our God-given mission, then the results will show. That does not mean, that does not mean that attendance will increase in numbers. There are lots of mega churches today that are simply not living out the mission that Jesus laid out in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where Jesus says, I was hungry, you fed me. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. That's the message we're to live out. The important thing for each church is to discern what God's mission is for that church and then live out that mission to the best of our ability. We all have different spiritual gifts. So do churches. Churches have different missions, different gifts. Today, we have heard some good criteria for both preachers and congregants so that we can evaluate ourselves and one another. This morning, in what way are you living out your calling as a Christian? In what ways, in what ways are this congregation monitoring and evaluating our ministry together? And maybe most importantly, how can we improve what we are doing, becoming more authentic, being more in tune with the Word of God? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, help us, your children, to be more in tune with your word, with your message. Help us to discern what our mission is, what you would have this church do, so that we can go make disciples to the best of our ability. Amen. Will the deacons please come forward? You're going to need to pay attention today to my offering meditation because it's only got nine words. So you'll miss it if you don't listen the first time. Give God what is right, not what is left. I'll say it again. Give God what is right, not what is left. And the deacons will now collect our tithes and offerings.
Gracious God, just like a shepherd leads his sheep, lead us to take these gifts that have been given this morning, to use them right here, right now, for your glory. Bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We prepare for communion by singing together, remembering that everyone is invited to God's table. reading this week that the Coast Guard, <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> the Coast Guard um, developed the ability to lower baskets down to help save people. That was the first thing they did. But they had quite a problem with the people not getting to the baskets and getting in the baskets so that they could be raised back up. So they developed the Rescue Swimmer program. You knew I was going there. Good movie. And the movie to which we refer is The Guardian with Kevin Costner. Yep. And it is awesome. It is an awesome movie about what it takes to be a rescue swimmer who helps those people get into the basket so that the basket can be raised up into the helicopter. Think about that. Think about that. Now, John tells us in the sixth chapter, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not be hungry, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. And anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. We all need those rescue swimmers. Let us pray. Good morning, Lord. How amazing your creation is. Morning follows night. Spring follows winter. Children become adults and your love secures and blesses it all. As we join together in communion with you this morning, asking forgiveness and receiving grace, please strengthen us to share your love and your good news. We love you, Lord. In your precious name we pray, amen. We are the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, all are welcome. All are welcome at this table as God has welcomed us. 
For it was on that night so long ago when Jesus gave himself up for you, for me. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, the third cup, the cup of redemption. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out just for you. Drink from it, all of you. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes once again. Would you join me in our prayer of dedication? Oh God, by coming to your table, we receive more gifts than we deserve. Renew us so we may be willing, so we may willingly serve as Christ served. Amen. You may be here this morning having never accepted Christ as your Savior. You may be here seeking a new church home. I would invite you to come as we stand and sing our hymn of dedication, Trust and Obey, page 556. We'll sing verse 1. Bye, 
the reason I kind of snickered at the communion table is because I had a feeling I knew where Barb was going with what she was going to say. I just had that feeling that she was going to mention the guardian and what, because that is really what the Coast Guard is, in my opinion, most famous for, is how many times they rescue people at sea. And, and they do an incredible job. And if you've ever seen that movie, you know how it ends. In the movie, and I don't mean to spoil this for you, but it is an old movie, so you should have seen it by now. But in that movie, at the end of the movie, Kevin Costner gives up his life to save somebody else. <laughs> now, think about that. Jesus gave up his life so that we would all be with him, so we could be if we choose to be. How many times does one other person give up their life for us? Just think about that as we go this, this week, okay? Uh, with that said, would you join me in our closing prayer? Gracious God, we do thank you that you sent your son to give his life for us so that we may have life eternal with you. Help us to live out our mission of going and making disciples. Watch over us as we part and go our separate ways. Keep us safe above all this week. Help each one of us to live our lives in such a way that others will truly see you in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah.